All right, so here's a 63-year-old white male who presents with abdominal pain, history of hypertension, and coronary artery disease, status post-bypass back in 2001, four-vessel bypass. These are the medications, atenolol, beta blocker, lovastatin for cholesterol, lisinopril for blood pressure, and an aspirin. CT chest and labs are within normal limits. Dr. Wood, just before we continue, I just, it may be confusing for some of the people that the biopsy showed oncocytoma, but the, but the lesion was still treated. And I just wanted, you know, I know that we do it, some of you, some of you tend to do a biopsy separate from the time of ablation. Others have a patient get biopsy prior to ablation. Um, whether or not the biopsy is being done for active surveillance or for diagnostic purposes prior to treatment um, can sometimes change how things occur. So had the biopsy been done uh, prior to thermal ablation, thermal ablation may not have been completed. That's, that's, that's correct. And that's the challenge, and that's something else that we struggle with with patients here, particularly at MD Anderson, because patients usually come from far away. And so to tell them to come here, have a biopsy, wait three days to get a result, and then have a subsequent procedure, you know, obviously they want to economize their time and minimize the amount of hotel bills and so forth. And so to accommodate that, many times we'll do the biopsy and then do the procedure. But in this case, this, prob this patient probably could have gotten by without a, uh, without a procedure. All right, so um, good point, Brian. Uh, bypass times four, CT chest negative, labs within normal limits. Here's the tumor. Here's another view. Um, Dr. Karam, what do you think? Um, discuss all the options and recommend partial yeah. nephrectomy. How would, you, how would you do it, open, robotic, what? Uh, this one I would do it robotic, just uh, based on the location and the size of the tumor. It's uh, small enough and uh, peripheral enough in the kidney to do it. Would you biopsy it all? No. Okay, Dr. Mateen, thoughts? No, I agree. I think it's uh, a robotic partial would be fine. Cameron, what do you think about ablating it? Um, I think it's doable. Um, it's, it's on the larger size. Uh, I would probably put calipers on it and, and measure it carefully. But it's exophytic, which means that it doesn't involve the central portion of the kidney. So tumors that are more exophytic or grow out of the kidney are easier to treat. It's surrounded by intra-abdominal fat. There is nothing around it. So technically, it's feasible. Does tumor size influence your choice of RFA versus cryo? Yes, it does. In fact, um, um, larger tumors are, there's a, there's a cutoff for the RFA. RFA is very effective up until 3.6, 3.7 centimeters. There, a good study showed that once you go one centimeter beyond 3.6 centimeter, then you have, a, by a factor of two, you reduce your effectiveness. So um, all of a sudden, your effectiveness drops significantly. So people have tried cryoablation. And yes, you can create a very large ice ball, but it does require placing multiple cryoprobes and uh, being very aggressive. And that also increases the risk of bleeding. The group at Mayo Clinic treats tumors that are as large as seven or eight centimeters. I think all of those patients really should go to surgery, but I guess if surgery is not an option. The largest we have treated probably about five or six centimeters. There are other adjuvant things we can do to enhance the ablation. We can actually get inside the kidney through an angiography approach and block some of the blood supply to the tumor. And actually that creates um, a kind of a uh, blo um, uh, blood deficient area, if you will, a hypovascular zone where the ablation is actually more effective. So yes, larger tumors can be treated if needed, but obviously if the patient is a surgical candidate, surgery would be a better option. So this patient underwent a right partial nephrectomy with intraoperative ultrasound. Final pathology reveals a right renal mass, renal cell carcinoma, nuclear grade two, four centimeters in diameter, confined to the kidney, margin of one millimeter. <coughs> Dr. Delacroix, the margin of one millimeter, that sounds really close. Is that a problem? Uh, it's, it's, this is renal cancer, it's, we're not breast cancer. Uh, the one millimeter, yes, it's, it is close, but uh, it really has no clinical implications. Uh, I treat this as a negative margin. Uh, nothing different. Yeah, so and the message is, I mean, again, in trying to spare nephrons, any margin is a good margin as long as it's a negative margin. So this uh, patient comes back for first year evaluation, chest x-ray, CT abdomen are negative. The patient develops recurrent right flank pain, gross hematuria, in its September of 2012, so two years after surgery. Uh, the meds haven't really changed, no interval change in past medical history. And here's the scan. So you can see here's the right renal remnant, and there's this 
rather large tumor hanging off the right renal remnant extending to the body wall and uh, may or may not be involving the retroperitoneal musculature as well as the rib. Here's another view. Again, you can see lots of postoperative change, potential extension to the side wall here, but definitely a recurrent tumor present in the right kidney. And if you go back, it's kind of where the old tumor was, but perhaps maybe a new tumor, hard to say. What was his and the patient surgery? now had, I'm sorry? What was his initial surgery? What did y'all do? What did we do? It was an open partial? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So the patient presents now with this, and then on CT scan, we see a nodule in the right lung, as well as some nodules in the left lung. So, patient had a localized tumor, four centimeters, resected, has a sort of what looks like an aggressive recurrence with pulmonary nodules. Dr. Karam, how would you approach this patient? So, uh, I assume this patient has a good performance status and uh, except for the uh, gross hematuria? Correct. Um, I would offer the patient uh, surgery. Uh, number one, uh, he has the bulk of the disease or the cancer is in the kidney and the uh, abdomen area, so I would resect all of that aggressively. Uh, and the bulk of the disease is there, so that's where we should go. And the, the other thing is the patient's symptomatic. The patient has uh, bleeding in the urine, and surgery will uh, take care of that as well. And then give the patient a break and then refer him to our colleagues with uh, medical <coughs> oncology to uh, offer him therapy. Any role for biopsy here? Biopsy of the primary tumor or biopsy of the, one of the lung nodules? Uh, no, I think it would be safe to presume it's the same type of tumor. And even if it's not, the patient's still symptomatic and good performance status and has a problem in that kidney that needs to go away. So I would not biopsy the patient. All right, um, you refer the patient to Dr. Tanier prior to surgery. Dr. Tanier, how would you counsel this patient? I agree with uh, Dr. Karam. I would go with surgery up front for the reasons Dr. Karam mentioned. The bulk of the disease is in the kidney or the remnant of the right kidney. The patient is symptomatic, is bleeding. I would uh, do surgery first. Michael, any, any difference from that? Would you recommend surgery? I would, I would recommend surgery. And I guess, you know, we're kind of alluding to the fact that there's not a lot of data for cytoreductive nephrectomy. In our current era, there were, there were two trials that had virtually identical inclusion criteria in, in the so-called cytokine era that showed a benefit in terms of overall survival for cytoreductive nephrectomy. We're presuming that there's that benefit now, although there will be several trials, Carmina included, that may answer that question. And then in addition, our, as far as our new targeted therapies go, most of the patients in those studies, so 80, 90 percent, had had cytoreductive nephrectomy or nephrectomy one way or another. So I, I, we're I, presuming there's a benefit. I think for the people in the audience, we, we've all of a sudden introduced this new word, cytoreductive. We should just clarify. Everything you've seen up to this point has been renal masses without disease that is spread somewhere else. Cytoreductive nephrectomy is when you have a very good idea and you can see disease that's spread elsewhere, should we be treating the primary tumor? Uh, and that's, that's what we're discussing here. Thank you. Just letting them know. So the patient undergoes cytoreductive nephrectomy. It's clear cell histology, T3A. Patient returns in follow-up six weeks later, has same pulmonary nodules that have slightly increased in size. Uh, Michael, what are you going to counsel this patient? What are you going to recommend? So I was trying to, I was trying to remember the patient's comorbidities and things like that, but I think um, depending on the patient's comorbidities. Hypertension uh, and coronary artery disease status post by, by, bypass. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're always thinking whether high-dose interleukin-2 is an option. Probably, based on the patient's history, I would be concerned that that patient could tolerate the, the different fluid shifts associated with that. Um, if the patient were motivated, we could pursue further workup, including, you know, cardiac uh, echoes and pulmonary function tests and things. Again, we're, we're assuming we've removed the bulk of the patient's disease in the kidney, and there are only some, several small bilateral pulmonary nodules. I think most likely, though, the case is going to be um, either number two or number four, thinking about our VEGF receptor TKIs, sunitinib or pazopinib, um, or certainly clinical trial. This is a, a probably a good or intermediate risk patient, um, and that would be, uh, that would be uh, level one evidence or standard of care. Did Dr. you do the nephrectomy through 
the, the previous flank incision, or did you go through an abdominal incision? Abdominal incision. And was it involving the, the rib or no? no. Just Dr. Tanier, what are your thoughts? I agree with Michael. Um, he, the patient is not a candidate for high dose AL2 because of coronary artery disease and bypass. He's at risk of uh, having cardiac arrhythmias and, uh, uh, you know, p potentially fatal complication from that. So the options would be target therapy. I prefer participation in a clinical trial. Uh, it depends on the patient, uh, where, the, where the patient lives, and if the patient is going to be followed at MD Anderson or followed up locally. Um, I think the, it's always more convenient for a patient to take an oral agent. So while bevacizumab plus interferon is, is an option based on level one evidence similar to sunitinib and pazopanib, I think you're giving the patient two parenteral agents, one IV bevacizumab and the other one is interferon injections. So the inconvenience, the cost of that would make me, uh, if the patient is not interested in clinical trial or cannot come here, then I think sunitinib or pazopanib would be the two options. Which of the two? I think uh, data, they're comparable in efficacy. I think you, you, one would look at uh, the patient's uh, liver function tests, history of any liver disease, uh, where the risk of pazopanib uh, having liver toxicity will be higher, then that will sway me towards giving them sunitinib. Um, and then if, again, the patient wants to follow up locally, I think it's always important uh, for the patient and for our professional relationship with our colleagues who refer patients here is to discuss the patient with the local oncologist. If the local oncologist is comfortable using sunitinib, then I think, you know, sunitinib would be fine. If they prefer to use pasopinib, then I think pasopinib is fine. So are, are the two equivalent, essentially? I think in terms of efficacy, there is uh, a trial that was presented uh, uh, last year uh, in Europe. Uh, the COMPARES trial, looking at uh, both agents in a phase three trial that included uh, 1,100 patients, the efficacy was comparable. So that trial was uh, designed uh, with a primary endpoint non-inferiority based on progression-free survival, which means uh, the time from initiation of therapy until there is disease progression or death, the two arms, the two drugs uh, produced uh, basically similar or comparable results. In terms of toxicity, I think, you know, uh, each drug has its own adverse events. Sunitinib, for those patients of you who have taken it, uh, is associated with more fatigue uh, than pazopanib uh, overall. Um, pazopanib, as I said, is associated with more liver toxicity. I think they both produce about the same in uh, diarrhea, um, uh, although sunitinib causes more hand foot Reaction, skin reaction, which is the blisters, calluses on the hands and feet. But I think uh, sunitinib has been on the market longer, so it was approved in January 2006, so seven plus years. I think there are uh, patients who are uh, survival, uh, survivors <coughs> past five years on sunitinib. Um, uh, I, don't, I think the follow-up uh, with pazopanib is shorter, so I think that should also be taken into account. Um, uh, so it remains to be see, seen whether five years from now the two drugs produce the same number, fraction of patients who are alive, uh, you know, past five years. But for all practice purposes, I think they're comparable in their efficacy. Okay.